a drastic comparison that I like to make is if you were to compare chicken nuggets to the same amount of just chicken breast, there's about 30 times the microplastics in the in the chicken nuggets. Um, so that's a way that I like to communicate to people how much higher the microplastic content is in these foods. Dr. Nick Fabiano, uh, you've looked a lot at microplastics. You've looked a lot at the brain. Why do microplastics like the brain so much? Mm -hmm. So yeah, microplastics or, or the brain in general is what we call to be a lipophilic. And what that means is that it likes lipids. Um, and microplastics have a predilection to go towards the brain, which is why we see much higher levels in the brain compared to other organs. So there's been a handful of studies looking at liver, kidney, and, and stuff of that sort, but we see much higher levels in the brain. So it seems that there is a natural predilection to the brain, and specifically the smaller particles that can actually get beyond the blood-brain barrier. So what does a lipophilic mean? Does it mean it's, it's made up of fats or are, are microplastics technically like lipid-based? Is that kind of like, like where they attract that way? Mm, so not necessarily lipid-based, but they seem to have an attraction to the lipid. So lipophilic just means fat-liking essentially. Okay. So the, the microplastics are able to more easily transverse the blood-brain barrier. Whereas again, we're still, they're still working out mechanisms behind, behind how this actually happens. But this is kind of the thought behind how this may be possible and why we're seeing such high levels within the brain itself. Yeah, yeah, because right now, I mean, a lot of the data we have is like kind of this correlative stuff, right? Mm -hmm. Like autopsies, looking at these things, like higher amounts of, of microplastics. And mm -hmm. I'll let you kind of, you know, take that. Mm -hmm. But there was a, a recent study that you, you know, we were talking about, this is talking about, you know, mm -hmm. microplastics and ultra processed foods and an interesting connection there. Can you explain a little bit about that? After today's video, I put a link down below for it element electrolytes and now in case you haven't seen it they have their sparkling electrolytes like an actual can a ready to drink can of electrolytes in a sparkling fashion so it tastes like a soda but you're getting the electrolyte effect so if you're in a caloric deficit you're trying to cut or you're trying to build muscle but stay lean at the same time these things are amazing because you can sip on them during your workout and it feels like you're sipping on a soda, but you can also sip on it throughout the day and it just tastes really good. But they still have the same 1000 milligrams sodium, 200 milligrams potassium, and 60 milligrams magnesium. Totally fasting friendly. They won't break a fast. You could have them before your fasted workout. They also have their regular packs, which of course I still use all the time. Like that's my baseline. But anyway, that link down below gets you a free variety pack with any purchase. So free variety pack, all you got to do is make a purchase and you get a sample variety, uh, excuse me, a sample variety pack with each flavor. So you got like a citrus salt, which is like lemon lime. You've got a watermelon salt. You've got a grapefruit salt, all these really good flavors. So that link, go to drinklmnt.com slash Thomas, drinklmnt.com slash Thomas. And it's in the top line of this description. Make sure you check out their sparkling flavors. Yeah. So recently there was a study in nature medicine and, and what they did was they looked at microplastic levels specifically within people's brains. Um, what was interesting about this study is there's been a handful of studies so far looking at brain microplastics, but what was new with this one is that they looked at brain microplastics, they correlated it with year over time, age, all these different variables, but also with the diagnosis of dementia. What they found in general was over time, microplastic content throughout the years have increased in people's brains, um, and it was actually associated with higher levels in those that had dementia which is very interesting to see. It's not necessarily meaning that microplastics cause dementia because we know with dementia, there is a leaky blood-brain barrier, which can predispose someone to have more microplastic intake, but it is an early signal because most of the other studies so far, which are scarce, have only shown some of these physical health manifestations. So it was exciting to see, or not exciting, but maybe shocking to see that, that this was happening. And then by extension, within this paper, um, we had previously written, written about significant microplastic exposure sources. So one thing that's very common is ultra processed foods and specifically within the us over 50 percent of energy intake comes from ultra processed foods and ultra processed foods have high levels of microplastics largely due to how they're prepared how they're packaged and different things like that and a drastic comparison that i like to make is if you were to compare chicken nuggets to the same amount of just chicken breast there's about 30 times the microplastics in the in the chicken nuggets um, so that's a way that I like to communicate to people how much higher the microplastic content is in these foods. Um, and by extension, so in the literature, we know that there's associations with ultra processed foods and adverse mental health uh, impacts. So associations with de uh, depression, anxiety, uh, and that's on observational data. So looking at large amounts of people. But in the same veins, we know that in randomized control trial, when you take someone that has depression and a poor diet and you improve their diet by eliminating microplastic or not microplastics, ultra processed foods, you see a benefit to their depression. Um, and there's, no been, there's not been a direct study looking at microplastic reduction and uh, depressive outcomes. But in this paper, what we posited was that 
in these associations that we see on a population level where ultra processed food intake is related to depression and anxiety and from the interventional lens where removing them leads to an improvement in mental health potentially microplastics could mediate this connection maybe not the whole thing because i do think that the nutritional content and everything else of the food is important um, but there may be a link there and it's a very hard problem to study because you can't really ethically expose someone to microplastics. And it's also very hard to quantify on a population level what someone's taking in. But we wanted to put this out to really let people know that this may be a potential link that warrants investigation because from an individual level, it's great from an educational stance, but also on a population level, if we are really able to see the signal that could prompt further movement to work on the processing procedure or the packaging of these foods to minimize microplastic content. Because again, this is affecting a lot of people if that link exists. And there's no direct evidence yet, but we really need to uh, investigate that association. Well, especially when, I mean, you realize that microplastics are extremely hard to clear, if mm -hmm. at all, right, out of the body. And it's largely going to be a cumulative thing. Mm -hmm. And as we're like reaching a point in our life now when like you said, over 50, I think it's something like north of 70% in the U.S. Mm -hmm. like actually cons you know, consuming uh, their calories from ultra-processed foods. Mm -hmm. It's like we have this generation, almost like you're in my generation, mm -hmm. where like we're going to have such an astronomically higher cumulative buildup of microplastics, mm -hmm. which I would like to see like data aligning like the, the rates of dementia along with the rates of mm -hmm. microplastic intake, right? Or ultra-processed mm -hmm. food intake. Because mm -hmm. we have a lot of studies that look at ultra-processed foods being linked to all these issues. But then when mm -hmm. you actually, there's also recent studies that are coming out saying like, okay, well, ultra-processed foods themselves are not in their silos having these negative effects. So what mm -hmm. is it? Like, is it mm -hmm. the hyperpalatability where people just eat more? Mm -hmm. is, I'm sure that's the issue, obviously, but maybe these microplastics are a bigger Mm -hmm. arm of that when we ever thought, right? Like here we are pointing the finger at the hyperpalatability, which is mm -hmm. certainly problematic. There's no doubt there. Mm -hmm. But we're pointing the finger at possibly even the wrong thing. It's just mm -hmm. like, hey, this entire you know, microplastic equation might be a, a big part of it. Mm -hmm. And then to that point too, just to bring up a point within the study, something that's at least reassuring is in the nature medicine study that I was describing and not directly linked to the ultra processed food, but from the microplastic lenses, over time, the, the microplastic content in people's brains seem to increase. That's kind of a time-based analysis based on uh, time of death. It was a post-mortem analysis of people's brains. But they did analysis by people's age, and they actually found that that was not associated with microplastic content. And what that tells me is that the body has mechanisms to clear mm -hmm. microplastics, and we're not entirely sure of how. There's early signals of what might make sense, but that's reassuring to me to say that as you age, you're not just having higher and higher and higher amounts, but your body is able to somewhat get rid of it. So a common question that people ask me is, you know, in this study, they found an approximately a spoon's worth of microplastics in your brain. So the common question is, how do I get it out? And right now, the answer is there's not really a definitive one-to-one -one association to remove it, especially directly from your brain. But I think more of the evidence lies in avoiding sources of exposure, which is very hard because it's all around us, right? Microplastics are in what we eat, what we breathe, stuff like that. So we, we discuss different routes of avoidance for microplastics. Um, so one of them is actually on our desk right now. Uh, I did water, that on purpose. I wanted, yeah. to, I wanted to see if you'd get done. <laughs> yeah, so water bottles could be a significant source of microplastic exposure and other things like uh, warming up your food in, in plastic containers can be a significant source or um, specific foods. So as we mentioned, ultra processed foods seafoods, uh, alcohol even can. And again, this is largely due to how they're produced and, and how, they're, how they're made. Um, and as I mentioned, one of the big ones is avoiding warming up foods in, in your plastic containers and stuff of that sort. But even in the air we breathe, depending on where you're living and where you are, pollution and microplastics can go one to one. So sometimes we recommend having air filters to take that out of the air as well too. And I think one thing is there's two lenses to this where People may see it as, you know, being overly careful and, you know, there's no clear risks yet. But how I see it is if we know that there's a significant amount accumulating in your brain and there are some early signs for adverse health consequences, I think it's best to minimize the amount that you're taking in until the evidence is out in terms of what's exactly happening. Because we don't know when that will happen. We don't know if that will happen. But for me, at least, I don't want a spoon's worth of plastic in my brain. But a perfect example is, you know, it's okay to sometimes have a water bottle. It's okay to sometimes have these different things. You'll drive yourself crazy trying to have zero plastic exposure in today's day. Um, so as to just kind of avoid what you can. I'm going to treat it as a hormetic stressor and just eat as much of it as I can <laughs> yeah. and just see if I can get like stronger at adapting to it. <laughs> yeah. But 
you know, all jokes aside, like there probably is, our bodies are highly adaptable. And mm -hmm. I do think that eventually, like our bodies are probably going to start to develop a way to deal with it because they're not mm -hmm. going away anytime soon, right? I don't mm -hmm. think we're going to eliminate microplastics. I'm not mm -hmm. saying that no one should be concerned about this at all. Like, mm -hmm. But I also know that probably over generations, maybe not mm -hmm. in even our lifetime, like perhaps the body's going to find a way to clear them better. And mm -hmm. I, I'm becoming increasingly interested in like the mechanisms in which the body is potentially clearing them because mm -hmm. there probably are mechanisms uh, related to exercise, things like that, to help maybe clear mm -hmm. them faster. But no one can say with certainty, but it is mm -hmm. refreshing to know that you're not just, you know, if you went through a period of time where you have a, a large mm -hmm. amount of microplastics coming in through your diet or your environment, that that's with you forever, mm -hmm. right? But it would make logical sense that the more sedentary you are, the more, you know, when you start looking at just mm -hmm. simple, like, clearance pathways within the body, mm -hmm. that movement is probably going to help eliminate them. Mm -hmm. But again, can't safely say with certainty. Mm -hmm. um, why is it, in your opinion, they seem to affect uh, just our, our brain? Like, do you think there's an effect with uh, oxidative stress, with neuroinflammation? Mm -hmm. Because we've seen in like other organs, okay, it's actually impairing function. Mm -hmm. But I recall you saying there's no direct studies looking at like mental health and microplastics, mm -hmm. right? Like we don't really mm -hmm. know 100%, mm -hmm. but we see it in the other organs. We see, okay, it's actually impairing function, usually due to, um, you know, reactive oxygen species or just added mm -hmm. stress on the organ itself. Mm -hmm. um, is there anything in the brain? And mm -hmm. if not, what would your speculation be? Yeah, so most of the literature right now is based on animal or cell culture studies. So it's not always a one-to-one -one association in terms of mechanistic. And, and we've seen big changes for different studies where you see this mechanism in a rat, for instance, and not in the human. But what it seems is largely, you know, broad scopes of what you see for a lot of other things like ultra-processed foods and stuff. So generally inflammation, as you mentioned, oxidative stress. There's not a clear one-to-one -one pathway, especially how this links to mental health, because Mental health is such a broad term as well, too, whether it's depression, anxiety, of, of how that link exists. So I think it will be a very difficult topic to really study in terms of seeing someone's microplastic exposure, what that does to their brain, and then what that does to mental health, and what that does yeah. to their brain while they're experiencing that mental disorder. And I don't know that we'll ever have a, a clear answer, because even in the nature medicine study that I was discussing with the dementia di diagnosis, it was post-mortem, right? So people that had passed away, they were looking in their brains, and they were just quantifying microplastic amount, but didn't get really an idea in terms of mechanism. So yeah. it's very difficult to study. It's hard to say mechanistically what's going on, because again, humans aren't necessarily, we're not rats, so we don't know if these associations go one-to-one. -one. But I think it is in line with some of the mental disorder path pathophysiology that we are aware of. So inflammation is linked to a lot of different mental disorders, not necessarily as a sole causative factor, but it certainly can make stuff worse. So seeing that that is in your brain, and logically, again, too, I like to just sometimes go back and take a step back from the research realm and say, if I have that much plastic in my brain, it's probably not a good thing. Some people argue actually the opposite, that it, maybe it's inert or something, but my own bias would be that it's not good. Yeah. Um, but I hope to see studies come out, but I think it'll be quite difficult to get a definitive answer from that stance. I, I want to go in, a, in an interesting direction for a mm -hmm. minute, and it's going to be something that I don't want to put you on the spot to make any mm -hmm. kind of weird hypothesis on it. But mm -hmm. Obviously, you're aware of the lymphatic system, right? Mm -hmm. Like, and sort of the brainwashing, sort of cerebral mm -hmm. spinal fluid that kind of happens at night. And like, and there's evidence of like sauna increasing, like mm -hmm. the intracranial pressure that can help with lymphatic. Mm -hmm. Could one speculate that that the lymphatic flow and like mm -hmm. increasing, like perhaps sauna use by that creating that intracranial mm -hmm. pressure can help flush those metabolites out? And because mm -hmm. I mean, we see it with metabolites, but we don't necessarily mm -hmm. see it with microplastics. But I don't think mm -hmm. anybody studied it. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, it's like if I had to just randomly reach in the hat and grab like one thing that I would mm -hmm. say would probably make an impact, I'd say, well, mm -hmm. maybe that. Mm -hmm. But maybe I'm completely mistaken. Like, does mm -hmm. the lymphatic system actually help flush out metabolites? Does it mm -hmm. actually help cleanse the brain, so to speak? Mm -hmm. So from a microplastic lens, I wouldn't be able to give you an answer for definitive evidence for the lymphatic system. But we know it is implicated in a lot of the neurodegenerative conditions. And it's interesting that you bring up the sauna and exercise sort of thing, because not from the lens of the brain removal of microplastics, but there is one study that was done, not with microplastics, but with BPA. So it's wow. a chemical used to make plastics, which is very commonly found in plastic containers, all these different mm -hmm. things. They took a study, I believe it was of uh, 20 people, and they induced sweating. I forget exactly how, I think it was exercise sort of thing. Um, and they found that in 16 of 20 of those people, 16 or 16 of 20 had uh, BPA in their sweat, okay. whereas other avenues didn't have as much of the BPA present. Mm -hmm. So it suggests that induced sweating, whether that's sauna, whether that's exercise, 
may lower the BPA or, or have a route of decreasing BPA, but there's no direct evidence for microplastics, specifically within the brain. But it's an interesting hypothesis. And again, big caveat is it's a it's a, quite a small study that there is no replication for. But I think it is an interesting kind of early signal because exercise, sauna, or even exercise from the virtue of kind of getting your bowels moving and, and, and getting microplastics out mm -hmm. via a GI route could be something as well too. But there's just so many gaps yeah. in the literature to give a definitive answer. But I think some of these mechanisms make sense. And I'd love to see repetition of some of the studies, but also new studies that can kind of prove some of these. Yeah, I mean, it's sometimes it's the sexiest answer isn't the real answer, right? Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's the stuff like what makes the most sense? Like, mm -hmm. okay, the basic elimination, like sweating, urinating, like getting mm -hmm. the bowels moving, getting this thing so that you can actually have any chance of elimination because you're mm -hmm. not gonna magically get rid of it. Mm -hmm. So let's just pretend for a second, you do have some magical thing going in your body that can dissolve microplastics mm -hmm. and make them excretable. Regardless, you're still gonna have to do the things that would allow you to excrete it, <laughs> right? Yeah, so yeah. it's like, no matter what you should, eat. That's, that's what the, the, issue I have with like detox talk, right? Like mm -hmm. it's like your body can detox, but it's mm -hmm. not detoxing through these weird mechanisms mm -hmm. that people are kind of implying. It's detoxing through the winds that are like very obvious, mm -hmm. but also is possible for your body to detox. It's literally mm -hmm. what it does, but you just have to encourage those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. And it comes down to the not so sexy things like mm -hmm. exercising and sauna and the stuff that mm -hmm. we know we should be doing. Mm -hmm. But it's also like our best chance at, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? It's mm -hmm. like the, they not have all the evidence in the world, but it's the most logical step mm -hmm. and it's probably our best chance. And I think it's an interesting point you make because beyond microplastics and even in the mental health, physical health realm of things, oftentimes we want these quick fixes. So whether it's a, a supplement to replace something or, or X, Y, Z, but it really does come down again, back to the fundamentals, which is one of my views for mental health is exercise, diet, sleep, can really do wonders, whether it's, you know, from a microplastic lens, whether it's from a mental health lens. Um, and, you know, skipping over these will not do benefit to yourself or anything of that sort, but it's really the fundamentals of your health. So even things like sleep, we know is important for glymphatic drainage. Now, do I know if that improves uh, your microplastic levels or decreases the levels in your brain? I can't say that with certainty, but these fundamentals are so important. And I think it's important that we emphasize that and we don't lose our fundamentals in chase of some magic cure or something because they're going to indirectly benefit your health, which likely will have benefits to your mental health, likely the microplastic side of the thing. Um, and it's important that we don't lose sight of that as well, too. Yeah, well said, man. Well, Nick, where can everyone find you, man? Yeah, so I'm mostly active on my Twitter or X, but I'm starting to be more active on my uh, Instagram or YouTube. Same ad across all of them. So it's NT Fabiano. Uh, I try to be more responsive on my X. I post regular studies every day or two. Uh, so yeah, follow me there if you if you enjoyed and it was great to have me. Well, thanks. Thank man. you.